It's good to be in the house of God. Amen. We're on week two of in transit, meaning we're in a transition period in life. Really, our life here on earth is temporary, and we are eagerly awaiting the return of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Yes, hallelujah. But as we go through it, we will face opposition. We will face trouble and trials. And how do we go through it? How do, how do we survive through tough times? Well, I believe that everything and anything that you may face in life, the answer is found in Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father unless he does it through me. So I want you to go to Hebrews 12, one, uh, verse 1, uh, and I think I've shared this scripture before, and even though I'm not going to expose this text, I believe this is, we're going to finish where we're going to start. Um, my goal today is to bring some confusion into your mind and then try to point you to Jesus Christ for the answers and not me. So I'm going to instigate your thought process And hopefully accomplish what I've been praying we can accomplish together. It, uh, it rocked my world when I started looking at it this way. But hopefully with the help of God and the Holy Spirit, we'll, we'll get through it. Amen? Amen. Hebrews 12 says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Are you thankful that he not only died, but he resurrected, and he conquered death, and he destroyed? The enemy is already defeated. It says, verse number three, consider him who endured such a position from sinners, so that you will not grow weary. And lose heart. If you are growing weary. And if you are losing heart. Look back at the cross. And look at Jesus. And feel his love. You know. I think sometimes. Faith doesn't make sense. Just like many things in life don't make sense. There is always a dilemma. A paradox. There, is always, there are always decisions we need to make. And we always weigh both sides and decide based on either side. I try to clarify it a little bit more. I, I read a story of this uh, marriage and, or soon to be married couple and uh, the girl was hesitant because she loved him and he was a good guy but he didn't have a lot of money and he didn't have any education. He didn't have a house for her. That was really bad, right? But on the other side, he was very loving, caring, romantic, responsible, even with the little he had. And that's a really good thing, right? What was she supposed to do? In life, there are always decisions we need to make. There's always this give and take factor when we make decisions. And I have discovered that in Jewish culture, they would often pose a question or a point of view, and then they will bring another point of view totally against it to contradict what they were affirming. Um, now, in our world, in our Western culture, we always try to have definite answers. It's either black or white. We just want to know yes or no. We don't like the maybes. We don't like the gray areas. We struggle with concepts. But in Jewish culture, two opposing views are often unresolved and just accepted as a paradox. That's something that really doesn't have a good answer. Uh, this, this is something that Jesus had to face in, in his time. You could say that Jesus is at the very center of a lot of unresolved questions we have today. And I think that when it comes to faith, sometimes we approach God trying to find definite answers. God, should I take this job Or not. And we want an angel to come down and say yes or no. <laughs> But God is in heaven. He's saying, well, it's up to you. What is my destiny? I just want to figure out my destiny. Or single people. I just know that God has the one for me. What if he doesn't? What if he doesn't care? 
And he's just saying, and he's just, and he's just saying, you know what? I, I've given you enough for you to choose for yourself. Now, married people, you look at your spouse. If you don't have complaints, you picked her or you picked him. It was your choice. Don't put that on God. So I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you today about the problem of faith. This is the problem of faith. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. What is the gift of God? Faith and grace. Both are a gift from God. It is not by works so that no one can boast. So are we saved, saved by faith? Are we saved by faith? Yes. But Philippians 2.12 says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You have to work out your salvation. So are we supposed to work for our salvation? Yes. Is it by faith? Yes. So it's not by works. No. But you have to work for it. Yes. I'm confused now. Jesus is 100% God. Jesus is a, was 100% human. He had to perform miracles to show his divinity. But he also wept in his humanity. He was also hungry in his humanity. He was tired in his humanity. But he was God. How could he be tired? God doesn't get tired. Well, but Jesus did. God is full of love. In fact, God not only gives love, God is love. Love. Yet he allows tragedy and injustice to take place in this world. How could a loving God allow bad things to happen, even to good people? But wait a minute. Faith is even more complex. I've heard both things. I've heard people say, man, we've complicated following Christ so much. It's so easy. It's so simple. Yes, it is. But it is hard at the same time. Right. It's going to cost you everything. It's a free gift, but you have to be willing to die for it. Mark 9, 35 says, sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and said, anyone who wants to be first must be very last and the servant of all. So wait a minute. If I want to, I have to, you get the point, right? In John 12, 25, it says, anyone who loves their life will lose it. While anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. What are we supposed to do then? All these contradictions have been around even in the Old Testament. Let me give you some more thought-provoking factors and scriptures. In Exodus, it says that no one can see God and live. No one can see God and live. I've heard people say, well, I don't believe they saw God because in scripture it says that no one can see God. Yet, in chapter 33 of Exodus, it says that 70 elders of Israel saw God and they lived. I've got a problem with faith. Faith is complicated. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. But I still believe. Amen. In Deuteronomy 15.4, Moses promised the Israelites that if they are obedient, if they would be obedient, there would be no poor among them. No one would be poor among them. But verse number 7 of chapter 15 of Deuteronomy Begins with, if anyone is poor among you. And then later, it encourages people to be generous. Do you know why? Do you know why we're encouraged to be generous? Because it says, and I quote, there will always be poor people in the land. <sighs> and see, Western culture tries to find definite answers. We try to resolve the conflict and the tension in our walk of faith. And we don't like to live in the in-between. We, we don't want to have any what-ifs. 
in our walk with Christ. But every journey takes time. And last time I checked, we're living this life only for a moment. If you make it to 100 years, 100 years are nothing compared to eternity. But wait a minute. The tension gets better and better. Do humans have free will? Or does God foreknows our actions? Because he knows everything, right? Now, this question has divided Christians for hundreds of years. Some say, well, he already predestined everybody. He already knows. He already set in place who is going to be saved and who is not. On the other hand, humans have free will. On one hand, no one can be saved but by God's initial grace. In other words, God draws people to him. It's in the Bible. John 6, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. Now, I know what you're thinking, right? Uh, why doesn't he draw just everyone to him? Problem solved. Just, just, just make everybody get saved. If he's the one forcing us to turn to him, why doesn't he force us all together at the same time? Because we have a choice. There's this thing called free will, John 7, 17. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. So we have two pictures, right? On one hand, if God wants you to be saved, you will be saved. <laughs> now, on the other hand, God is in heaven. Hoping that we will choose him. Which point of view is right? Both. <laughs> Both, right? You thought I had the answer? I don't. There's no definite answer. He draws to himself everybody. But we all have a choice. I, I, I love the way this proverb, this rabbinic proverb says it. He says, everything is under God's control. Everything. Yet, man has free will. It's confusing. Because we want the answer. But we don't have it. All we have is both answers. And you can embrace both ideas as true. Scripture supports both. He draws. We choose. And last time I checked, he died for the whole world. In Exodus, also, Pharaoh hardens his heart. It says that he has rebellion in his heart. He's not willing to repent. And he himself hardens his heart. Yet in chapter 15, I mean in chapter 8, verse 15, it says that God hardened his heart. So was it Pharaoh's fault or God's fault? Did God make him do bad things or was his own choice? Well, both. Why? I don't know. Don't ask me. But it says that after these, God foresaw that 400 years in the future, after they were delivered from Egypt, he foresaw that 400 years in the future, the Canaanites would become so evil that he would have to kick them out of their land. This is in Genesis chapter 16. But he also offered the Israelites the choice of whether to take on his covenant or not. He kind of knew what could happen and he gave them a chance for that not to happen. I know what you're thinking. You're confused. I am too. God sees the future. God knows what you're going to have for lunch today. But you still have to choose. Explain that one. All these examples bring frustration to our logical mind. But here's what is important. They, in the end, these yield final authority to Scripture rather than our logic. In other words, we can get confused and try to find answers, but we don't have the answer. Scripture has the answer. That's right. And what do you end up with? What, what do you end up with when you pose these life-threatening questions? You end up with faith. 
I found this quote in a book I was reading this week for preparation. It says, making sense of everything is not an obligation or even a possibility. There are some things that you and I will not understand. And by the time we make it to heaven, we won't even care anymore. Listen to this. Acceptance of a mystery is an act not of resignation, but humility. You know why a lot of people fight God? You know why a lot of people continue to live against what God has told them to do? It's pride. It's pure pride. God, until I, don't under, until I understand everything and everything about you, then maybe I will. Or until, until you show up in my life and do what I've been praying for, then I will. The, the problem is that we forget that we're limited. And maybe we've been waiting for answers that will never be answered. That will take faith for us to pursue and to go after. The problem of faith is that sometimes it will not make sense. That at some point along the journey, you will have to face the reality of your limits. And it is in those moments when you can look up to heaven, fall on your knees, and remember that even with our limitation, Jesus still died for us. And you can say, I don't understand this, but I believe. I don't understand this, but I forgive. I don't feel it, but I will give. I don't feel it, but I will go to church. I will drag myself out of bed. It is my only day off, but I will go and worship you. Amen. Amen. You see, one of the biggest problems of faith is waiting. The problem of faith is that you have to wait for some things to happen. Colossians 1.25 says, I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. He says, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. Hebrews, Hebrews 11 is, is the chapter of faith. I don't know if you've read it or not. Hebrews 11 is the one that begins describing faith on verse 1 and then defining faith on verse number 6. Verse 1 says, now faith is... Okay, some of you know it. Good. That's more a description of faith. I think the definition of faith is found in verse number six, where it says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. That's what faith is. Faith is believing what he said, doing what he says, and waiting for him to do what he said he would do, no matter how long it takes. Amen. But if you read chapter 11, it gives you Several heroes of faith that we read stories about and that we teach children about. And, and, and every time it says, on a lot of verses it says, by faith, so-and-so left everything to go after God's promises. And, and we read the stories and, and we never stop and wonder how many missed their calling. It says, by faith, and then it gives a description of the promise. And then it says that so-and-so left everything and went after the promise. And my wondering, as I was reading, is it possible that Abram could have been Mike? Or that Joseph could have been Robert? What if Esther was supposed to be, put your name on it? Sandra, she raised her hand, so... <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, let me try to make it more clear, at least what I thought when I was reading. We assume that they are the heroes of faith because that's how God said it to be. We, we think that Abram is Abram because God had in his mind that Abram would have to be Abram. But what if Abram still had a choice? How many names could have been instead of Abram? Maybe we read it and we assume that because God knows and God sets everything in place, it is what it is because it was supposed to be because he made it to be. And in a way it is, but in a way it's not because scripture also says that we have free will. So maybe the unfolding events that we see and that we read about could have been unfolded in a different way. But we don't know because we're limited by time. 
And what we have is today. Right? Some what ifs are hard to explain. What if the names we read are those of those who responded to his calling? Free will. Of course, God knew and he knows. It's mind blowing to try to grasp the knowledge that God has. But we don't have to. That's why he's God and we're not. That's why he just gives you enough for every day. I think, and this is just my assumption. This is not exegesis. This is not so deep. But when he says, give us today the daily bread, it, I think he gives you what you need for every day. And some days, it takes courage to love those kids. I'm just kidding. Most of the days, it's very easy for Norma to love me, right? But, you know. Some days, you're going to need courage to forgive that person that hurt you. Some days, you don't even think about it, but some days, you need it. Some days, you need faith to know that he will provide when you know that the checking account doesn't reflect. But you still trust. God knows our future, but we don't. We just have today. God knows our past, but because of the blood of Jesus Christ, all the sins are washed away. Amen. The question, I guess, is will we trust him and go after that future that he has in mind for us? Because you and I have been called, but it is up to us to respond. Amen. You cannot say, God, may your will be done, and then sit down and wait for his will to be done. Well, his will will be done with or without you. But his plans for you, only you can go after them. You, in a sense, have to build your own future. Of course, he's God. I'm not, I don't want to take God's place in this. I don't know if I'm complicating it too much, but there are some things that will not happen in your life unless you do something about them. Yes, God will show up in miraculous ways. God will provide in miraculous ways. But most of the times and a lot of the things that we can accomplish in this life, we have to work for them. With his grace on our side, with his strength on our side, with his favor on our side. Yes, he opens doors. Yes, he closes doors. But you got to work for it. It's like a workout, right? Workout sounds fun until they're in the middle of it. If faith worked that way, and it does, maybe we could see it clearly, a little bit more clear. But I don't sit down and just think about doing crunches and <laughs> then six packs start showing up. You know? <laughs> This takes a lot of work. <laughs> You're thinking, yeah, you probably eat a lot of cheeseburgers. Yes, that's work, okay? Why are you getting me sidetracked here? You and I have been called by God. You have a calling from God. Not to accomplish great things on this earth, even though you will if you trust him. But your main calling is to glorify him with everything you do. We are to reflect his glory and nothing else. You have a calling, but you must respond to it. Faith implies a response. There is no true faith without a response. Some people say, well, I'm not going to church. Well, I'm not serving. Well, I'm, I, really, I really feel far from God, but I, I have my faith. I, I keep my faith. Well, you're not having faith. You think you're having faith. You like faith. You know the definition of faith. You may even be good at criticizing people who don't have faith, but if you're not responding to his calling in your life, your faith is dead. When you read chapter 11, it says, by faith, then explains the plan, then the calling, and then the response. Do you want to live by faith? You got to know the plan. 
If you don't know the plan, you can live by faith. You have to hear his voice. You have to sit down. You have to meditate in his word. You have to read it daily. You have to know the plan, God's plan, right? For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper. Yes, he has plans for you. I think sometimes the missing link is the action part of faith. Take action no matter the circumstances, no matter the trials, no matter the difficulties, no matter how much it costs and how long it takes, I will believe. So I want to kind of like start closing, but not really, with three things. Because one of the heroes of faith, or the one that got a lot of this new covenant started, was Abram. And in chapter 12, it says that the Lord told him, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household into the land I will show you. Go to what I will show you. Not, look, here is the land that you have to go to, and I'll take you there. No, you go. And you don't even know what it looks like. You just have to go. You just have to trust. And then he says, I will make you into a great nation. So number one, he promises a land. And number two, he promises a seed. I, I, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. So he gives him a land, a seed, and a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will, blessed, will be blessed Through you. And guess what happened? He went. He believed in God's promises. And he, believes in, he believed in, in God's covenant. And, and scripture says in chapter 15 that it was accounted to him as righteousness. His taking action by faith was accounted to him as righteousness. You want to live in victory over sin? Walk by faith by living in obedience. If you know his story, you know that he had a, a tough journey. It was not easy. He, he had to wait for a long time for some promises to come to pass. When, when it was completely out of his hands to make it happen, when he could not have a child of his own, then God shows up. Because as long as you keep trying to make things happen on your own, by your strength, by your own cleverness, it will not happen, no matter how much faith you claim to have. You have to be willing to surrender and say, God, it's not on my time. It's on your time. It's not by my strength, but by your strength. It's not by my spirit, but by your spirit. And when he was completely out of his hands, God gave him a son. And there's a lot more into that story. But here's what, is, uh, here's what I want to point out. You have a calling. God is calling you. To live for him. So I want to talk about the calling. John 15, 16. And if you're taking notes, you're going to have to take notes fast. Because this is not on the screen. John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. You have a calling. Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You have a calling. 1 Thessalonians 5.24, the one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. You have a calling. Amen. Philippians 3.14, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. You have a calling. 2 Thessalonians 2.14, he called you to, his, to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. You have a calling. 2 Timothy 119, he has saved us and called us to live a holy life. You have a calling. Second Peter 2.21, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. You have a calling. I didn't pull out all the scriptures, but I still have more. First Peter 1.15, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Do you have doubts about your calling? You have a calling. God is calling you just like he called Abraham to believe, to go out of your comfort zone and just go after him and pursue him. He has called you. Now, when he calls you and you respond, 
you and I get an upgrade. When we respond to his calling, we can, his calling, we get an upgrade. I'm not talking about iPhone type upgrade. Where they fool you and you pay a lot of money for a phone. Let me hide my phone because then you start judging. <laughs> just kidding. I'm just kidding. Listen, Abram went without knowing the land, without having the son, without having the blessing. In fact, many times he felt like he was being cursed, but in fact, God was working behind the scenes. Just because you don't see it, it doesn't mean it's not there. In fact, you may not even feel it. There are Sundays when you show up to church and worship is great, but you felt nothing. God is still there. This is the upgrade. Abram could not see the land and could not see his son, but the presence of the living God was with him. That's the real upgrade. When you're praying for a miracle and the miracle doesn't happen, but you get closer to God, you're thankful for the trials. You're thankful for the pain because God shows up to comfort, right? That was a real upgrade. Maybe your miracle is not here yet, but once you respond to his voice by faith and turn to God for help, by faith, he promises to come and live inside of you. I think we're missing the upgrade. I think we're forgetting that God's presence, the living God, comes and lives inside of us. I can care less if he gives me a bigger house. I can care less if he gives me the car of my dreams. If I have him, I have everything. Yes, I know. God is worthy, right? God lives inside of you. You have a calling, and when you respond, the living God lives inside of you. What else do we need? Amen. Ephesians 3, 16 says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. See, Abram went before the physical world came to a fulfillment. Verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Faith doesn't make sense sometimes. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love. And he keeps encouraging us. John 14, 23, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. We are the temple of the living God. 1 Corinthians 3.16. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? You know why this place feels like filled with his presence? It's not because of the screens or the sound or the chairs or the carpet or the black ceilings. It's because of you. Because the temple is not this building. You and I are the temple. And when we worship and you feel God's presence, it's not, it's not anything else but God's presence being manifested through us. That's right. Amen. Hallelujah. You are a temple of the living God. Romans 8, 11, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. You may not see it, you may not feel it, but by faith, the moment you turn to him for answers, the moment you turn your back to sin and went after him, you got an upgrade. You have been made new. All things are gone. All the all things, the sins, the, the regrets, the hurt, everything is gone. You are made a new creation. 1 Corinthians 13, 9. You may not see it, but it's still there. You got to stay on track with your faith. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. Verse 12. For now we only see a reflection as in a mirror. But then we shall see 
face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. If you're struggling, hang on to your faith. Christ is in me. Christ is in you. I've got an upgrade. You've got an upgrade. People can criticize you, can judge you. People may know your past, but they don't know that God has forgiven you. Amen. But we're still living in the tension, right? We're still living in the in-between. The problem of faith is that we need more faith every day. That, that's why the disciples came in like, we, we need more faith, right? Increase our faith. After Jesus taught him how to pray. That means that you're there, but you're never there. Scripture says that you're made holy. But the dilemma that we have, and even in our Bible study sometimes, well, no, because sometimes I sin. Well, yeah, you sin, but in Christ you're made holy. You're perfect in his eyes, but you're not at the same time. But you are. But you're not. <laughs> you're sanctified. You're presented as righteous person before him. Uh, but, but you're not at the same time. But you are. That's why you need more faith every day. Because if your faith doesn't increase, there will not be any change manifested in your life. Every day God reveals things in your heart that need to be checked. 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 You're getting an upgrade every day, really. <laughs> you just got to be bold enough to recognize those things. Say, God, today I feel a, bit of, a little bit bitter. Like, God already forgave this person. Then you go to the mall and then you run into them. And then <laughs> the trueness about your feelings shows up, right? You got to be willing to go back and say, Lord, I thought I had it, but I don't. Help me again. You go out to dinner and you run into them again. Just kidding. <laughs> Do you know why we can trust? Do you know why we can remain in this journey of faith even when it doesn't make sense? Because God made a covenant with us. You know what a covenant is, right? When, when somebody says, I give you my word. And he not only gave his word, he gave his life. If you read in Genesis chapter 15, there's a covenant for the land that God makes with Abram. And I don't have the time to explain all the things, but God shows up and he promises Abram to give him the land. And he makes a covenant with him. So much so that God himself, most theologians agree, shows up and walks between the sacrifice to seal the covenant. Abraham didn't walk through it. It was not a covenant from Abraham to him. It was a covenant from God to him. And how many of you know that God is faithful, that he doesn't break his promises? That he does, does what he said he would do. That he did what he said he would do when he sent his son, Jesus Christ. And he eagerly awaits for humanity to take on his covenant. Amen. We're in a time of grace, of forgiveness, of mercy, of restoration. But time is ticking. He will heal. He will deliver. He will save. His promises are still standing. How will you respond? Here's the thing, though. All of the promises are fulfill, fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And Jesus came, he died, and he resurrected. And now is our time to respond. See, with Abraham, it was a covenant made from God to Abraham. In Jesus, th this covenant was foreshadowing what Jesus would do. He would come and he, die in our, he would die in our place to forgive our sins. Now remember, God promised Abraham three things. And if you read on the chapter 11 of the chapter of faith, at the end, it says that all these men, heroes of faith, all these people died and never saw what was promised to them. That's what it says. It says because they knew that there was a greater promise that would be fulfilled along with everybody else, meaning us, those who would believe. 
And so God promised Abram land. And even Abram realized that the dwelling that he longed for was not just a physical reality, but a spiritual one. It was, Abraham got to a point where he knew that it was not a physical land, that it was a spiritual land that he had to fight for in his journey of obedience, in his journey of faith. Hebrews 11.10 says that Abraham was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. See what I'm saying? Sometimes we come to Christ and we look for temporary things, and I'm not against it. I'm just saying there's an ultimate promise that surpasses any earthly promise that you may be fighting for. Abraham always lived in tents because he knew that the eternal city would be built by God. His forever home was not this earth. It is what we know now as the new earth with a new Jerusalem built, with, built by God where he dwell. Well, he will dwell with us forever. And you know what makes that possible? Jesus himself. But beyond this, for this life now, Jesus is our dwelling place. He is our promised land. We are rooted and built up in him. Colossians 2, 7 says that Jesus is our promised possession. He is our inheritance and we are his. He dwells in our hearts. Ephesians 3, 17. This physical earth will be replaced by the new earth and we will live forever with Jesus. But beyond that will live forever in Jesus and He in us. He is our true inheritance. So God promised the land to Abram and it was fulfilled through Jesus. Not through the earthly promised land. He promised him a seed. Jesus is the ultimate seed of promise. It was not Isaac and it was not his descendants. Everything was scheduled to point to Jesus Christ. Like Isaac, whose birth was miraculous, Jesus miraculously was born to fulfill the covenant made with Abraham and to fulfill every promise God ever made to mankind. Galatians 3.16 says the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture doesn't say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. And Paul saw the fulfillment of this covenant in Christ. Christ is the seed. God promised Abraham a great nation. Was this fulfilled physically? Yes. It became Israel. But was this also fulfilled through Christ as he creates a holy nation, a new royal priesthood unto God? God promised Abraham a blessing. God told Abraham that through him every nation on earth would be blessed. And by now you know where this is going. Jesus is that blessing. Isaac, Jacob, Judah, David, Solomon, these offsprings do not bless me, at least not eternally. They give me great examples, but they don't do anything beyond that. But Jesus is the blessing because he is the substitute for all humanity. He's the one who would be born to the woman, born without sin, born to die. He would courageously carry his cross and die the death for you and me that we deserve. No other offspring has done this for, for us. Ephesians 1, 3 says, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Your blessing is found in Christ. Your healing is found in Christ. Your provision is found in Christ. Your promised land is found in Christ. There is no fear in Christ. There is no regret in Christ. There is forgiveness in Christ. Christ fulfills every promise for you. If you're excited about it, you got to give him a better praise now. Would you stand up? I want to read. I told, you we, I told you we would end where we started. And hopefully this passage will make more sense now. Even though faith doesn't make sense. Hebrews 12, 1 says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, those who by faith live, maybe, angels that are watching down, looking down at us, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Amen. You know what's that race? 
following after Jesus. Amen. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such a position from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Father God, we give you worship today, Lord. We give you honor today, Lord. And Lord, even with our doubts and with our confusion, Lord, we still believe. We will trust you, Lord. We will throw off any sin that is in our lives, Lord, and just follow after you, Lord. We want to be holy before you, Lord. Purify our hearts, purify our souls, purify our minds, Lord. We want to glorify your name with everything we do, Lord. And I pray that if anyone here feels far from you, Lord, that you continue to draw them, Lord. The calling is there. Break every chain, Lord. Break, break every bondage, Lord. Break any addiction, Lord. Bring healing into our souls and even into our bodies, Lord, today. In your name, chains are broken. In your name, captives are being made free, Lord. Because of the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. We claim that today is a day of victory. And we give you glory, honor, and praise because you are worthy. Give him praise this morning. God is worthy.